Hey guys, welcome to another Revitalization Blueprint podcast. I'm your host, Ollie Matthews. Today, I've got a guy that I met on a private island in, on the outskirts of Croatia back in June. And one of the things that this guy said to me really resonated and kind of changed the way I was thinking on the island. We've got a guy called Ron Lynch here. Ron, how are we doing? Fabulous. Good morning to you or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Yep, so it's, it's just after three or half three here at the moment. On the island, I remember after uh, Jesse Elder's talk, and I was getting a little bit overwhelmed, and I've said about it before about scaling up, talking about how I love con uh, speaking to people on the one-to-one -one basis, and it's just something that just clicked with me when I said to you that I was getting overwhelmed about going to 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 dollar months like some people are doing on there, and they're amazingly successful at what they do. And you said to me, what do you love doing? And it, it was just at that moment where I realized again how much I love coaching people on a one-to-one -one basis and that it's the right thing. And I feel in that moment, it was obvious that it's not just about money. Money helps, don't get me wrong, but what makes you happy can actually make you a wealthier person. Ron, tell us a little bit about the history of where you've come because I listened to a little bit of Chris Reynolds' uh, podcast, <clears throat> another guy who was, uh, he's been on the show as well, and he was on the island, and the history was actually very, very interesting, how you, you went from, it was, it was working in a store, right? And then... Yeah, I, I, was, a, the I was a kid, where I was cleaning the meat department in a grocery store, and when I was 15, 16 years old, and eventually I became a grocery checker, and then a department manager and then a customer service director at a grocery store. And I, I had to learn how to deal with the public and really, you know, when you, and I think we all experience this even today in our businesses, we have customers that are difficult and some that are easy, but learning how to, how to deal with the public was uh, an important part of that and, and thinking strategically in, inside the grocery business. And at the same time I was in the grocery business, uh, one of my best friends who actually was over here for dinner last night uh, was my college roommate and he um, he he wanted he fancied himself an actor and so he was auditioning for movies and he had an audition and he asked me if I wanted to go on it and I took the opportunity to skip a day from college and skip a day from the grocery store and went to uh, audition for a movie and I got a I got a SAG card so I got a part in this movie and it was a pretty prominent American director uh, Robert Altman was directing the movie and that kind of sent me down the road. Uh, prior to that, I was kind of headed towards law school. And after that, I was headed towards uh, filmmaking. Yep. Uh, so I, I managed to, to, I was in Seattle at the time, and I managed to, to make uh, uh, 10 or 12 movies that I, I was in as an actor, and I stayed on as a crew member. So I learned how to make films from some very good filmmakers and worked with a lot of movie stars and things like that. And one day uh, I was on set um, and I was fortunate enough to be standing within about six feet of Jeff Bridges, who your audience probably knows as the dude from the Big Lebowski. And yeah. uh, Jeff Bridges, I just asked him, I said, you know, how do I get to be in your shoes? Because I wanted to be a movie star. And he said, well, first, make sure your dad's Lloyd Bridges. Which just <laughs> dad, you know, Can't come in much of a change there. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, that's tough. And he said, well, then write. Um, cause if you can write, you can, uh, you can, you can work in Hollywood because, uh, we always need writers and writers are always working. So one career I said, okay. So I took his advice at 20, 21 years old and I went home and I wrote two screenplays and I went back to my job in the grocery business. And I used to have a gal, um, that used to come in the store who was on an afternoon talk show and she used to come through my line all the time. And I stopped her and I said, Hey Dana, I've written two movies. Can you help me? Do you know anybody in Hollywood? She goes, well, why did you ask me? I said, well, you're the only person in Seattle that I know that works in television. And she goes, well, it's interesting that you asked me. Bring your movies in. She wanted to see whether I'd actually done it. So I brought two screenplays in, put them underneath my check stand. Two weeks later, she came in, and I grabbed her in the store and shoved my screenplays under her nose. And she said, okay, you did it. I'm, I'm curious as to, to why you knew to ask me. I said, I didn't know to ask you. I'm just asking you. Why are you being so weird about this? She said, well, my sister happens to be Kathleen Kennedy, who is Steven Spielberg's partner. I'm going to send these to her. And there's a huge lesson in that for me. And in a number of things in my life at that point was do the work first, get in there and, and commit 
Um, there's no such thing as an idea for a screenplay. That's called a post-it note, and everybody has one of those. I got a book I'm going to write, and I'll write the book. <laughs> yep. it's, you know, it's like someone tells you, I'm going to tell you a funny joke. You know what? You tell me the joke. I'll tell you whether it's funny. <clears throat> you Everyone's do got that, that idea. Well, I was going to make Uber. I was going to do Facebook. Right. Implementation. So, so that's, been a, that's been a constant recurring theme in my life is that I, I go and I do the work first and then present it and then get better at it. And I think that that, um, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about storytelling today. Yeah, let, let's, let's go into how you got into that. And uh, because it, it's gone into the infomercial side of things and the, the big thing that jumped out and it was one of the things you've done this, the talk on. And when you got introduced at Baby Bath Water was how you took GoPro with the advertising from $650,000 to $600 million. And right. what was cool there was that it wasn't necessarily the typical infomercial. It wasn't, here's a screenplay or anything like that, or here's a storyline. It was the, the red button when they're checking to see if it's actually recording and then splicing it all together. Um, but what, the, the different, how did that come about, actually, before we go into the story side of things? How did GoPro come about? Yeah. Um, I had a, we had an agency in Seattle and we did a lot of work for lots of brands that you're aware of. I'm sure the George Foreman Grill and yep. Sonic Care Toothbrush and OxyClean and um, the, the, our new business development guy uh, had gone down to Utah to uh, the Outdoorsman show and he invited me and we walked upon this booth where Nick Woodman was selling a, a, what I'm going to say a very inferior GoPro camera. Uh, you know, there's the, like the, the hero one. Yeah. Uh, and he had unloaded his van and his van had his skis and surfboards and all that stuff. And that was his show booth. And um, th that was the entirety of his company. <laughs> it was him in a van and a box of cameras. But we saw it and we we're like, oh, this is prime for, t for television advertising. Because we knew it was a vanity camera. Mm -hmm. We knew it was about, you know, the reason he created the company was because he wanted to film himself surfing. Yeah. Like, who, who doesn't want action photography of themselves? And the idea of t taking a camera and risking it or a crappy phone back then, like, it just, it, there was no real good solution. And his mounts actually were brilliant. The, the way that you could mount the camera to so many different things. There, I think that the, the mounts were at, as as critical to the success as the camera was. Yeah. So I can we just happened to bump into each other at this, at this show, got started a conversation and that turned into a relationship and a few dinners. And then that turned into a, a business relationship and we did the strategy and the, um, I never shot a GoPro commercial. It was all user generated footage. Eventually we hired athletes, um, you know, Sean White and what have you. And, uh, so we, we kind of went through that process kind of organically, but we knew strategically what we were doing. We knew how would to utilize say, the camera. And would you say a lot of it is down to being ready for when the moment comes? Because you said you met him there at this expo, but also when you had the screenplays ready for when Steven Spielberg's sister-in-law essentially came along, you were ready at that moment. Yeah, we're, we're and, and I think that that's the, the thing is, do the work first and be prepared. And then you're probably going to make it through the first conversation or two till you figure out what the actual job will be. Right. Yes. Yeah. The first two screenplays I wrote never got made. They just proved to them that I could write dialogue and have the dialogue sound like different people. Cause that's a very, apparently a very difficult thing for most people who get into screenwriting is all the characters tend to sound the same. And I had a knack for, they all had very clear different personalities. So how do you go about getting the story of these personalities out there? If, so if a, a um, it, it's, it's funny because I think that I, I hear people who are adept at writing tell this similarly. And this yeah. is really how it happens for me. Because I generally know the character at the beginning of my screenplay or my commercial. I know what I want to have happen and I know how I want it to end. I have no idea how it's going to get there. Okay. And so I start and I start writing. And when I write, just like here on Zoom and there's a little screen that pops up, in my mind there's a screen that's up here in the left corner of my mind. 
And I just watch the movie and I take dictation of what happened. And as things progress in the screenplay or in the commercial, I get surprised by stuff that I see in it. Um, probably not unlike when people dream. You dream and you go, yeah. how the hell did I ever dream that? You get caught off guard by the storyline in your own dreams. Well, I get caught off guard in the storyline of the stuff that I write. And that's when I know it's probably gonna be pretty good, is when it starts taking twists and turns that I didn't expect. And uh, sometimes from the beginning of a story, I get a vision of like, oh, I just instantly know how this, this should be. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I, and I, I think, it, yeah, I think it's part talent, but I think it's mostly practice. I would, I hated writing. I would never have actually written a screenplay in my life if somebody who I considered to be in a position of authority like Jeff Bridges said, go write a screenplay. And it also never crosses my mind that I can't do things. Yeah. There's, there, I just don't have that, that chip that says, oh, you probably shouldn't or you don't have the expertise because I realize we all come here naked. Yep. Nobody has the expertise to do anything when you start. You've had, had to learn at some point. Yeah. Every, I don't care if you're a neurosurgeon or a rocket scientist or, you know, I, I know I know neurosurgeons that can't program their own VCR and I know eight year old kids that can. Yeah, uh, and I think that's that's a big thing when it comes to most of the people listening to this are going to be either from fitness background where I've had my background, but a lot of people now listening to it are going to be entrepreneurs, busy business people, and they're told, <laughs> learn these methods of storytelling. How do they go about actually learning it? Because when I started putting a camera in front of me, I just literally stalled and was lost for words, didn't know what to say, couldn't speak, string two sentences together. How they actually start to know what they want to say? Right, and I think maybe when you start, you you might know your ending. Like I said, I know my beginning and my ending, but I'd not, I think what you're alluding to is you're, you get caught mentally trying to prepare a result. Yes. And I, I think that that's very risky. Like that's not helpful to the process is to go, oh, it's got to go this way. Um, I think that you should trust yourself to fail. Like I said, my first two screenplays weren't good, but they were done. And when they were done, we could see that I could write dialogue. So there's, oh, elementally, there was a skill set that was embedded in those that I could now go work on storytelling and arc and the, the, the thing that happens on page five and the thing that happens on page 60 in every screenplay. Like I could get the rules. Once I, once I had that, then I could go and work on the rules and I could write some better screenplays. And that happened for me. So yeah. Yeah, and I think as well, when people say to me now, myself, like, you're great at doing Facebook Lives, you're great at doing videos and, and things like that. But two and a half years ago, if you look back on my YouTube, that mm -hmm. wasn't really great. But it had to be done and going through it. What mistakes are you seeing people make, personally, given that there's the, um, the confusion about how, where to start and actually just start? And what other mistakes are you seeing apart from starting? Um, the, the most common mistake is narcissism, huh. which is talking about yourself and making yep. content about me and my life. And, Cause that's not interesting to people. The, the, they're interested in them. You need to be talking to them about them. That's what they're going to tap into. Now that doesn't mean you can't tell your story. That just means that when you think about telling your story, you tell your story about them. That makes sense. And secondly, I think um, how you engage a viewer with questions is important and being interested, not being, not, don't try to be interesting, try to be interested in something. Like we could talk about, I saw your post yesterday, like, oh, I want to re refabricate my book and content for a female audience. Yes. Like I am, I immediately looked at your book and knowing what I know about the female audience was like, I want to put like your title's fine. I want to go in and like make a whole bunch of statements about hormones and how each level of 
because the five hormones that rule a female body rule her life. Mm -hmm. And the, the five things that you could do around that. So you, they knew that they, you were talking to them at every age group because all of those hormones represent a vertical. If you're low on progesterone or low on estrogen or high on estrogen, like those all represent consumer verticals, like go into it about them. And that's what's useful to them. So, and then the, the last piece is I see people like you and I right now are having a conversation and it's completely left my mind that there's a viewer, which is okay. We're engaged with each other, which makes yeah. probably for a more interesting interaction. I'm not, I'm not thinking we're talking to a thousand people or 500 people or a million people. I'm talking to you. And if you learn how to focus and talk to one person through that little camera, you're there. That's those, those are the people that really do a good job. The, the Jesse Elders and the Rob Dials and the, you know, these guys that are online that are getting massive followings are doing it by just being really sincere and talking to one person at a time, the way this media is imbibed. Would you say that's the way that people remain true to themselves while telling their story or is there another secret behind it? Because I know personally, and I'll, I'll use myself as an example here because of the way that uh, I've, I know what I've personally done. I don't know what everyone else has done on here yet, but when my dad died when I was 15, I didn't realize that would be why I do what I do now. But um, I was worried about re remaining true by putting my story out, or am I putting my story about my dad out too much, but no one is coming from my heart, and that is why I do what I do, that he died suddenly because he was busy, because he was stressed, that I want to help busy and stressed people but how yeah. do i actually remain true to myself when telling my story knowing that essentially the end result is yes i want to get people on board to help them as a client uh but i want to help them at the end of the day regardless of whether they're a client i i think that you you do that through storytelling and you find those those clients and you start to tell stories about the client i had a person in this situation or that situation and i think that your motivation to do this is um, honest and people see that. They, they can tell the genuine from the disingenuine. And one of yeah. the challenges is when a person becomes kind of popular or kind of famous is they can lose that really rapidly and get swallowed up in their own, um, the, the, the myrrh of themselves being great. It's like, that's not particularly useful. It's uh, one of the things that makes longevity in like David Letterman and Ellen DeGeneres and Johnny Carson were all really good television hosts because they always made it about the guest. Okay. And they were always interested in the guest. It was never really about them. I think that um, not to be, I, I, I don't really want to, I don't want to say I'm slamming this person because I'm not, I, I enjoy them. But I think that's one of the things that's problematic about Jimmy Fallon's show and why it probably won't have a really long life is that all the guests are on Jimmy Fallon's show to make Jimmy look great. And all of the bits revolve around, oh, isn't Jimmy talented? Yeah. And, and can't he, you know, he can, he, he can hang with Bono and he can hang with, like, he can compete at some level with all of the, and it's kind of cringeworthy sometimes. You're like, dude. And, I, and so I, I, I encourage people to, to focus on the story and focus on the viewer. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons that, I mean, Ellen has got pretty big over here in the UK, but Jimmy Fallon hasn't. Uh, you have to physically search and be a little bit up on some of the pop culture in the US in order to actually even know who he is. And that, that's understandable. Now you've said that. I've not really been... Now, now you think about that narcissism that I said earlier. He's got this yeah. little bit... Of, it, I mean, it, it's self-effacing. He's a nice guy, but it seems narcissistic and it kind of is a turnoff. Yeah, that makes sense. And let, let's talk about... So I'm, I'm here. Um a professional in the fitness industry, working with busy entrepreneurs, busy business people, over 35. What is the creative... I'm here, I'm saying, Ron, I want to get an infomercial out there. What would be the creative process and behind getting that out there? What story would it be to tell? Because when, when I had my book launch and you wrote that post and instantly with the first line of copy you wrote, I think, what is it? Who did you vote for in your last erection? And instantly people are just, what? What's going on there? And now I've got your attention. What, what is the creative process behind making an infomercial if you're given that as a basis? Well, yeah, and I, I, you know, I make infomercials, I make TV commercials, and I write a lot of content. I do all of that stuff, but there's, there are, I'm going to say tricks to the trade. The trick mm -hmm. that you just explained is a, is a pattern interrupt where I take something that's very 
familiar and tweak it just a little bit and made it salacious. So you're, you kind of, and that, you know, that's the secret to good copy is you want them to read the next line. So whatever you write, you, they, they must read the next line and the next line, and the next line. Um, and hopefully they learn something and become engaged and entertained by that in the pro in the process. Um, but to, to start that out is I brief every business I do. So we own four or five companies and then I have four or five clients all the time. And I go in and I write a creative brief. So I'm going to know what's the problem. What's the solution? What's the USP? What's the sales argument? Who are all the customer verticals? How does the sales argument apply in what order to each one of those verticals? Because not every customer needs to hear the whole sales argument. Most people only need to hear the three points that pertain to them. What are the three questions that you ask up front that close the sale before the, the dialogue starts? So the first question, you know, there's three questions that you always ask if you're a really good salesperson. One is a self-qualifying one to the audience so that they know that this presentation is about them. The second is about the innovation that you're going to explain to them that they've never heard of before, so they should keep listening to this innovation because it's going to solve their problem, which qualified them in the first question. Yep. And the third one is you tease them with an offer that they're going to be able to obtain this solution if they hear you, hear you out. And if they were really serious about solving their problem, why wouldn't they? So that it's, it's a very simple formula that works over and over in everything. Um, but it's, you've got to take the time to do that five to 15 page brief before you even start. So now what you have is parameters because creativity takes a sandbox requires four walls around the sandbox to be a sandbox. You have a, a painting has a frame. You have to have a frame. You have to have constrictions in order to become creative. Creativity happens in lieu of budget. Sometimes you have no money and you've got to be creative. That's your, you, sometimes the, the audience is too vast. So you have to narrow it down. You go, okay, we're going to go to this audience. Then later we'll talk to that audience. Um, so there's all these different things that, that you actually want constraint. And then you want to say something that someone hasn't probably heard of or thought of before. Do you mind if we talk about fitness and, and cause let's talk about fitness, people over 35 and fitness for a second. Yeah. Okay. I think that most people in the fitness industry are talking to people about um, why they should take care of their body. And most people who are busy are thinking about how they can get away with not taking care of their body. The consumer is actually thinking, I'd like to go have some beers tonight. I'd like to smoke a joint. I'd like to eat this bad food. I don't want to go to the gym. And so you get, you get sucked into their conversation about their body and you start talking about, but if you move more and if you lower your calorie intake or, you know, increase your, your natural fats, you go down the keto road or the paleo road or all these things, you start to get into their argument. I, if I were in your space, I would get into a different argument. I would say, do you know what you cried for for about a million years? You used to be a spirit and you begged for a body because the only way you can engage in this world is if you're inside a body. If you were a spirit, you'd be walking through walls. You couldn't actually engage in this world. So before you were here, you probably don't remember it. You begged to be in this body. So now that you know that you begged for a million years to get into this shell, let's talk about how you can maximize all the experiences you have by taking responsibility for this machine that you're in and really enjoy the experience for as long as possible. Would you mind pushing away from the alcohol? Would you mind pushing away for the cigarettes? Would you mind pushing away from the fried food just for 30 days? And let's see what kind of experience we can have in your body by changing some behaviors that will be you taking better care of your body, which will have you take care of your spirit better, which will lead to a better experience. Nobody's talking to people like that. That is massively powerful. Just, I'm, I'm thinking, that, that, let's not put this out as a, as a podcast. Let me just do a Facebook Live and copy exactly what you said. That's what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> it's, your, it's your coffee. Yeah, well, I think with, with fitness, and I used to be so guilty of it, 
that every single person I was training would do the same training as me. If someone couldn't eat chicken and rice <coughs> five times a day, they weren't dedicated. And until I started working with entrepreneurs and I worked with a guy who, a really big pop star's former manager, and worked with him and he said, look, Ollie, I haven't got time for the gym. And that made me realize that, look, if he can get 10 minutes just walking on the treadmill, he can start to build momentum up. And he ended up going to Orange Theory classes and getting some really great results, 40 pounds in six months. But he was really busy. And when I speak to fitness professionals now about how I worked with him, they said, oh, you must have had him doing this diet, that diet. I said, no, he was just aware of what he ate. He still enjoyed his family meals. He still ate when he went traveling. And he still had a cigar every night. But he made some better decisions and better choices by getting aware of it and but the way you just phrased it there is that let's just take care and that as you have a better experience that is massively powerful it, it, it's changing the why for them because yeah. if you can change their why and not sound like everybody else like i didn't say anything about heart disease or weight or body right. mass index or uh, nothing that shit because that, that's all ancillary to the actual thing you're trying to achieve, which is a better life experience. So talk about that. And then I have to do the other things. Like you talk about this, this uh, um, agent manager. I'm sure that you said, hey, you've got, a, you've got a bed or you've got a chair in your hotel room. Put your feet on it. Put your hands on the ground and do an elevated push-up. Do 10 of those. Like you give them something that's, that's manageable inside their – their yeah. creativity, right? Inside of their borders, now you're getting creative and now you're writing fitness and nutrition inside the limitation. You became more creative. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Right? Yeah, massively. Uh, and yeah, some people are gonna want to have really strict diets, but it's not gonna work sustainably. And I think it's, it's looking at, as you said, look at that person and really get that person. And someone said to me about, with, with females as well, hearing about, how females well there, there's this perception that women have had a, a lot of years how they have to look a certain way but hearing it from a male written in a male's uh, voice and the words that has come from a male would potentially be so powerful to hear they don't have to look this exact way as well and that 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 actually um came to me as well so let's let's go through oh as we talked about just uh, being prepared, I've had all these prepared questions and now we've just gone completely off course. I'm like, okay, which one should I go back to with that? Uh, but we've gone, gone over. No, that's fine. We we'll want to talk about it. Sorry. You broke up there. Yeah. I, you broke up as well. Um, what, what would you like to talk about next? I'm sorry for <laughs> steering off course. No, you're good. You're good. Cause it's gone into much better and more powerful content than what would have been of just going through these questions. But, um, the creative process we spoke about, and you're given a brief. Let's break down the Samsung advert. So there was a vacuum cleaner and there was a baby there and it was kind of scary how, how it was done. This is the advert that you broke down when we're, we're on the baby bar Fort Island. Uh, sure, sure. Let's break down that. How did you actually come across? I mean, you're, you're there with Samsung as a brief. How did it actually come across to actually go down that route if you want to describe it? Okay, so what had happened was, um, you know, here we have this robotic vacuum cleaner that we're going to sell. The competitor is the Roomba. Um, Samsung has a technologically a superior actual vacuum cleaner. And so now you, you're dealing with a corporation and there's parameters within inside the corporation of what they'll let you advertise and what they want, what they feel is too far out there creative. And we presented them with 10 concepts for commercials. And this was one that they selected. Now... Um, I don't know if we can post a link to the commercial so people yeah. can get it later or something. But yeah. the, the basic idea is I had to know who the consumer was, first of all. And we had enough research done to know that the consumer was either a female parent or a female grandparent. We were selling as many vacuums to grandmas as we were to moms. So the, the, you know, that consumer was 30 to 65. Now, from years of working in the field of vacuums and carpet cleaning, I know from a dial test what moves the needle in a commercial is a baby and a puppy. 
So I knew I was going to have a vacuum. I knew I was going to have a baby and I knew I was going to have a puppy. And so the next thought was I need to eliminate the, I want the audience to put themselves in the scene so that w- w- the way we created tension was re- remove the adult. One of the things that doesn't appear in the commercial is there's, there's no grown up, no. there's no parent and no grandparent. So that leaves a hole for the viewer to put themselves in. So now it's not a baby with a mom or baby with a grandma, it's just a baby and I'm the mom or I'm the grandma. And the, as the commercial reveals itself, you see this child and this puppy kind of creating a mess and mayhem in the house. And there's some dangerous elements that come along. Well, the, the, we wanted to show that the vacuum cleans up after kids. So certainly we use Cheerios because every parent understands that, that mess because everybody feeds their kids Cheerios. Everybody's got a, that bag of Cheerios they give their kids. Then the second was that the device itself has a thread cutter. And anybody who's ever dealt with cleaning their own vacuum cleaner knows that the spool gets caught with thread and you have to go in there with the scissors and it's a pain in the ass. So we're like, okay, so we want the thread cutter in there. We want to know that it picks up dirt, grime, and all this stuff. But we wanted to build a story that was why it had to be done. And once an infant and a puppy are creating this mayhem, you're looking at the mess and going, oh, this is gonna be problematic. And of course the vacuum comes in and saves the day and picks up the, the thread with the needle. Like there's all of this tension that's built in the, in the content of the creative in just in 30 seconds. Well, from the outside looking in, we used um, kind of, a, I'm gonna say a light and fun soundtrack. Yeah. But you remove that soundtrack. So you remember the sound is 50% of a movie. If you remove that soundtrack, you could put in horror music and the scene would still play out because it's really a horror scene about what's going to happen to this kid. The kid's got, it's dodgy. He's got scissors and, and needles and threads. And, and then this mess is being made. Now you put yourself in the situation. Who do you become when your child and your dog creates a massive mess? You become a jerk. You're now screaming at a baby and screaming at a puppy. What the hell did you do? What the, you know, that's who we are as people. We're, we're taking and we're playing on the character flaw that we all have of having anger towards the weak. Uh-huh. And nobody likes being angry towards the weak. You want to be nurturing. So the purchase of this vacuum cleaner now takes care of that problem. And you never know there was a problem. So your character flaw is gone. By perch, the virtue of purchasing the vacuum cleaner, you've purchased the virtue of tolerance and kindness. And you're no longer that jerk that hates puppies and, and, and babies. You're just a wonderful parent and the place is clean and the problem is solved. When you watch it, you might think it's a vacuuming problem. The way we actually approached it is that it's an emotional problem. And one of the things that you hinted at, okay, now once I got all of that done, I had to go, okay, now how am I going to shoot this? I wanted the baby to be ominous. So I wanted to shoot very low and up. So the baby seemed huge. And the minute that image hit my mind, I went, oh, this is the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man from <laughs> Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters yeah. And so I copied their sequence shot for shot. I went, as he comes, you know, you see his feet land. Yep. You, never, you don't really see his face at first. And so we copied that Ivan Reitman used in Ghostbusters and there's this weight you get the sense of the baby being very heavy because it's in slow motion as the foot hits the ground and the whole scene shot out in slow motion everything happens in slow motion so you're taken kind of into another place in time and we duplicated many of the shots from that sequence in Ghostbusters to make it like a horror movie but with some lightness but it's also a movie everybody's seen so it's in the back of your mind and it's familiar and this connects to what you said earlier about how I wrote the line for your advertisement that said, uh, who did you vote for in the last direction? I'm taking something that's very familiar and just tweaking it. So you know you've seen it before, but you're seeing it in a different way now. So you watched, okay. so you know that I've already spun something, so you wanna see what happens next. <clears throat> so I, I think that's, it's really something that's, 
practiced, but it's something anybody can practice. It's something absolutely anybody can do. That makes sense. That makes sense. And what was the success behind the Samson one? Um, the revenue numbers. The, uh, was it increased by a certain percent? Um, oh, the, the revenue was massive and it still continues online. It's the, the, and there was a long form infomercial and a couple of short forms. I just showed you guys yeah. the one short form, but the, yeah, they, they had a, a multiple X increase in sales volume, both online and at the retailer. Wow. That is powerful. That's powerful. And that's the video. It's on your big baby agency, our work part, isn't it? So I'll put yeah, a yeah, link yeah. to that page in there. So anyone can have a look at that and some of the other work on there. What has been the most important infomercial you've done or moment in your career, whether it's been a screenplay or infomercial uh, that you've done today? Um, probably the first long form infomercial I did. So the very first infomercials I did were short form. So they were 60 second, 120 second spots. Okay. for Samsung and Space Bag. And uh, I directed one of those, the other one I didn't direct. But then I went and I did a, someone asked me to do a long form half hour show for a food processor. And it was called The Ultimate Chopper. And it was the precursor to the Magic Bullet or the Nutribullet. Oh, cool. And uh, we, we sold, I don't know, 80 million, $100 million worth of food processors in the first year or two. And the, I was very fortunate though, because it, what it, I had just left the grocery business and really what I was doing is I was taking my script writing and sales ability and my movie making skills and my demonstration and cooking skills from the grocery industry and putting those three things together. And I was just lucky that the first thing that someone asked me to do was a cooking infomercial because I really understood that space because um, we built these grocery stores based upon cooking demonstrations. So I knew how to, to like make it exciting and fun. And that was, um, the, it was critical to get, have the first one work, you know, cause that probably, if it hadn't worked, maybe I'd be slinging bricks right now. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's starting to build the momentum. So, uh, yeah, yeah it's, 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 I suppose we have to still have something to build the momentum on, to have confidence that we've had success and then be able to model the previous success to build <coughs> for the future success as well. And on that note, there's a couple of questions we ask all the guests on here. One is, what does success actually look like to you right now in this moment? Success to me is having a network of relationships in my life, both in my personal life and my professional life, where those lines are very blurry, where I get to work and live and love with people that I really enjoy and enjoy me. Um, it's not um, probably as glamorous and financially out there as probably a lot of people like, Oh, I got to have a hundred million dollar company. That sort of thing is kind of past for me. Like that's yeah. finances are great. Um, it's, but there's an awful lot of miserable people mm -hmm. with great finances. Like yeah. I wouldn't trade places with Steve jobs. You know, I think, I think he had a pretty, a pretty rough personal life. Um, you know, I think, and then at the other time, that doesn't mean all rich people are miserable. I think Warren Buffett's got a great personal life and is quite happy. So it's, it's, it's how you conduct, how you conduct yourself and how people around you feel about you, I think is yeah. really what is to me. That's true. That's true. And finally, what advice would you tell your younger self? That, that's probably a played out question now, but I do like to answer that, asking it. That's okay. Um, fail faster. Uh huh. That's Take the risks faster and fail faster. I like that. I you're like going to get to where you're going to get, but you're only going to get there by making the mistakes. So get out there and risk and let people let people laugh at you, scoff at you, be jealous of you. I don't care. I love that. I love that. I'm a, I'm a massive Michael Jordan fan. Hence, I've got this bloody great quote behind and it's just if you don't take the shot you're not going to hit the basket and yeah uh, so that that is really great advice you've given us on here uh i apologize uh, uh you went off track and i'm back on track and then off track but i got some amazing information on there and hopefully the listeners have benefited as well where can people find you we've mentioned big baby agency so where can people find you on social media if they want to get in touch with you or is it best to go through the websites uh, no, you can find me on Facebook. Um, 
I respond to Facebook. I respond to uh, Twitter. I think my Twitter account is Ronnie Lynch kills me. Um, R O N N Y O Y N C H kills me. Ronnie Lynch kills me. Um, Big Baby Agency is our agency side of the business. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. I, I wrote a book called Buy Now in 2011 that it's kind of a breaks down how to do a creative brief. And I'm currently writing uh, another book and have done an educational program that I'm going to release next year um, that I went through. Uh, I had 20 people go through, no, 70 people that turned into 30 people called The Marketing Mercenary, which I wanted to attempt to teach everybody what I knew. And so I started a course and uh, it's a mean course. It's an expensive course. And if you don't do the homework on week one, you get thrown out week two and there's no refunds. It's, it's brutal. It's meant to duplicate the client experience from a high level agency perspective. What it's like to land a client, what it's like to do the work. And if you screw up, you're done. So it's, it's a pretty brutal course, but uh, people who've gone through it have uh, changed their careers for the better. Every single one of them have finished. That sounds really interesting. Really interesting. Well, Ron, thank you for sparing the time. You're a busy guy, so thank you for sparing the time to uh, come on the show. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Good luck to folks.